So again, my name is Daniel. I'm coming from the Wealthfront data engineering team. Uh, Wealthfront is an automated um, uh, financial advisor. Um, we have about a quarter million clients here in the US and we're managing about $10 million for them. Um, and for those of you who've known Wealthfront for a while, you may have first known us actually as an automated investing service. Uh, the way it works is uh, you would come to us, we kind of evaluate your risk tolerance and what kind of accounts you would be interested in opening. Um, and then based on that, we uh, give you a portfolio and basically take it from there. Uh, but we quickly found though that one of the big value adds we had for clients wasn't actually just in the investment products themselves, uh, but in the simplicity of understanding what their investment plan was and why this was the right investment plan for them. So over the past couple of years, we've actually doubled down uh, and expanded our financial advisory services to help people plan uh, not just their investments, but their broader financial goals uh, and be able to understand the trade-offs between them as they plan those things. So we call this product PATH. Uh, this has obviously been a big uh, application um, for us to build, but it's also really uh, changed the way we build infrastructure too, uh, primarily on the data engineering team. Um, you can imagine that this has uh, been for us to transition between kind of orienting our computation flows around a daily trading routine to instead being this interactive experience. Um, so to give you a sense of what that looks like, I want to show you just a recreation of an actual experience I had using PATH. Um, so it started looking something like this. Uh, you can see this is my, my net worth graph over time. Um, I'm retiring allegedly at 60 there, and I'm buying a house in five years. Um, and you can see that it looks kind of weird. I'm, I'm running out of money there. I have equity in my home, but I'm actually running out of money. So when I looked into that, when I uh, figured out that I'm running out of money at age 78, that's not a great situation to be in. So I looked over at my retirement goal, and it turns out I am way low under cash. I need way more money than I'm going to have. And if I want to make it work, I need to work until like 78 or 79, uh, which was not really part of my plan. So I figured I probably had to uh, cancel my uh, home plan that I had. So I'm going to have to go back, look at the home goal that I had, and realize that in five years, I may not be able to buy my two-bedroom home over in Hayes Valley. So I uh, figured I should try and downsize that. And it looks like over in Hayes Valley, a one-bedroom home is about half the cost of the two-bedroom home. And you can see this already looks a little bit more affordable. And the graph looks a little bit better. But if I go back to my uh, retirement goal, you can see I'm still a little bit short on funds. Luckily, so Path is smart enough to be able to recommend a couple different things I can do. Um, so first, uh, it's giving me the option of, hey, you're, you're tying up a bunch of your liquidity in your home that's not liquid. If you're willing to downsize and sell that home when you retire, you've got a lot longer runway of cash. So maybe I'm willing to do that at 65. I can imagine being ready to move out of the city then. Uh, and we'll see that actually does move the needle a little bit, but it's not quite enough. So retiring at 60 is still not an option. I'm going to have to retire something more like 65, right? Um, so this is the kind of thing that PATH does for our clients. This is pretty common. Um, uh, and trust me that there's some complexity going through it. So when we think about this on the, on the data engineering side, there's kind of a whole flow of computation that we're worried about. So the first thing it just starts with is your cash flows. How much are you saving? How much are you spending? So we link with your external accounts, your bank accounts, your other investment accounts, uh, to be able to understand how are you moving cash and what kind of cash flows do you have. Um, these feed through basically through some machine learning models we have to be able to identify what is actual savings, what is spending, and then through th some financial models to project how is this going to change for you. Um, and then as we start getting more and more of this information, we're feeding it in Optimizer to be able to determine what are the best financial decisions for you to be able to make. You'll quickly find, though, that there's a, there's a bunch of things about you that we need to know in addition to that. So just things like your, your tax jurisdiction matter quite a bit. Uh, what's your income? What percentage of your income are you saving right now? That changes uh, a lot of what your financial picture looks like. And then there's higher level things, demographic information, like the industry that you work in. And that changes what your income growth is likely to be over time. Uh, we let you override those things if you want to plan for a more aggressive income growth, if you think that's likely. But we need to know if you're, like, you're living in Cleveland versus San Francisco, that's going to be different for you. Um, so there's all that demographic info. Most Wolfront clients don't arrive with just cash. They have a bunch of external things that they have. Maybe they have a 401k elsewhere. Maybe they have just a previous investment account. Um, and so we need to know what's in your other portfolios. Is it stocks? Uh, is it bonds? Is it diversified? Do you just have a bunch of Twitter stock from your former employer? Um, is all this stuff at a gain that makes it impractical to sell? You know, maybe if it's a Twitter case, maybe not. But we need to be able to check that. Um, uh, a huge part of financial planning in the US is just buying a home today still. So we need to know. Uh, when do you plan on buying a home? Where do you plan on buying a home? But most people aren't planning to buy a home at a specific time, at a specific location, at a specific price, right? So we need to know some general trends about how is that home, uh, how much is it likely to cost in a few years when you're ready to buy it? There's other big financial events, that classically windfalls, um, uh, inheritances around here, IPOs are actually a big one too. 
Other big events are people taking time off to travel. Similarly, people taking time off from maternity or paternity leave too. Uh, by the way, if you have a spouse, then we basically need to redo all this computation for them as well. Uh, I don't have kids, but I'm told when you have kids, that changes your financial situation a little bit. Um, then there's things like uh, Social Security. Do you want to take Social Security? When do you want to start taking Social Security? Maybe for the sake of your financial plan, you don't actually even want to plan on having Social Security at all because you don't want to trust that. Um, then there's the possibility of you need to figure out when you're going to retire. Um, and when you do retire, how much money do you be, want to be able to spend in retirement? Do you have a bunch of fixed income that you're going to have in retirement separately? Uh, that's possible. Then where are you going to live during retirement? Are you going to stay in your house? This is kind of like the decision I had earlier. Are you willing to downsize it? Do you have rental properties? Um, then lastly, planning for college is another huge one. That's a can of worms in itself. Uh, you can imagine that there's just a lot of things going on here. There's different data types. There's way different sources of data. The data is changing at different speeds. And there's a lot of different computation models going on. There's machine learning models. There's uh, rules-based models. There's kind of optimization models that do things like binary search optimization. There's expensive compute going on here. Um, if you're interested in the actual like, nature of the computation itself, we have a bunch of blog posts on our engineering blog if you're interested in that and, and kind of digging into how that works. I, I want to talk about kind of the infrastructure of how we serve this to clients too. Um, so one of the things that have, uh, has really been uh, important for us is understanding what are the requirements of the infrastructure we're building. Um, you know, one of the big requirements that we've had to deal with is this low latency requirement. So in general, like doing expensive computations is a solved problem. There's enough hardware in the world to do anything you want to do practically. Uh, but doing that quickly is a, is a different question. Um, and the way you build that infrastructure kind of depends on what that is for you. So uh, uh, if you can think, latency isn't just the only requirement here. But if it is, kind of the, the infrastructure you need depends on where you're falling on this 2D chart. So a classic case would be something like uh, Spotify's Discover Weekly sitting over here. So uh, if you haven't used Discover Weekly on Spotify before, it's basically a weekly recommendation of songs you might like based on uh, what people similar to you have been listening to the actual attributes, the musical attributes of the song, the lyrical attributes of the song, all these things go into it and they basically recommend what songs would you maybe like. Um, that's a classic big data problem, right? There are a ton of users, a ton of listens, a ton of songs on Spotify. Um, but on the, on the easier side, they only need to do this once a week. So this is firmly over in batch offline land that they can do it. That's one architecture. The other end of the spectrum would be something uh, like Slack notifications. If you've seen their famous flow chart of like 50 different steps of deciding when and where to send a notification, there's some real application complexity there. The data itself coming through isn't super complex, but you do need it really soon, right? We need this in a second or two is when we expect those notifications to come through. More similar to our use cases is something like the Facebook news feed uh, sitting somewhere over here where uh, they can update this every few seconds. They can probably do it every couple minutes, and that's OK. But there's complexity in that. One of my favorites is the Uber ride matching algorithm. We expect this to happen right in just a few seconds after you request a ride. Maybe it can take 15, 30 seconds, but not a minute. Like That's already too long. Uh, and it's really complex to do that matching algorithm, too. So Wolfront has historically sat somewhere over here. We do basically uh, daily trading, and we have some hourly computation that we need to do for the sake of that. But it's still over here in this batched land. Um, and because we're focusing on the interactivity and giving this new client experience, we've had to move way over to the left and fit in somewhere over here. Now, obviously, Uber and Facebook are serving this to way more clients than we are. But the, the infrastructure itself is a similar design because it needs that similar use case there, too. Um, a word of warning, in data engineering, we're generally pretty good about scaling systems up for volumes of data. We have lots of good frameworks for doing that kind of thing. We don't build things to scale for other requirements, like latency requirements. So generally, uh, if you build something and you want to make it faster in terms of latency, that's not an option you're going to have. You're going to have to redesign your architecture to do that. So that's something that we were taking in mind as we started this process. So I want to walk through a couple pieces of theory and then a couple kind of practical lessons we've learned that have been a big deal for us as we've done this. Uh, the first is this idea of Lambda architecture. So this was a term coined by Nathan Mars from Twitter in about 2011 uh, for designing these near real-time applications. Uh, so the big, the big goal here was isolating the complexity of writing these near real-time layers. So um, classically, this, this near real-time, this streaming piece, has been the most complex piece. The, the, the frameworks have been less mature, so they're just harder to use. Um, the operations are more sensitive. Uh, if a batch computation fails, you can rerun the batch and fix it. Yeah, maybe it's delayed a little bit, but if it was a batch computation, you're probably OK with that in the first place. In the streaming environment, in the near real-time environment, when that goes down, your clients aren't seeing data, or you're missing data from your, from your analytics, and that's a much bigger problem. Um, 
And then there's the classic case of some problems are solvable in streaming situations and some aren't. You can imagine taking the, uh, the average of 100 numbers you've seen. You can do that by just storing the total of those integers and the count of those integers. If you're trying to do something like the median of numbers, that's not actually possible. You need to store the full, the full list of numbers. It's, you can estimate it in a streaming context, but you can't do it perfectly accurately. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we basically separate it into three layers. Um, and we refer to these as a batch layer a streaming layer, and then a serving layer as well. So typically it looks something like this. As your new data comes in, you stick it in your warehouse and you do batch computation off that layer. You serve it via a batch view, um, and that basically is running around the clock uh, delayed, right? But it's recomputing for all of history. At the same time, you have this real-time computation layer that's generating a real-time view. Um, so we set, this is what we call the batch layer, the speed layer, and the serving layer. A little unintuitive that the serving layer just refers to the batch view, but that's just kind of the uh, canonical way it's been. So this was originally intended for an analytics context primarily, but there are a lot of really useful properties that, we, uh, that are helpful for kind of production, client-facing uh, applications as well. Uh, one of them just being this idea of when you deploy a code change, you don't want that just to be right for data moving forward. You want that to be right for all historical data as well, right? Which you get through Lambda architecture, because when you deploy the new stream, that corrects it moving forward, but to correct it uh, for the historical data, you need that batch to rerun. You get this, this idea not just of uh, eventual consistent, but of eventual accuracy that you get from this batch layer, uh, that you get from running the batch layer and the stream layer at the same time. So when this was introduced in 2011, I think the canonical stack was something like Hadoop uh, for the batch computation, uh, Storm for the streaming layers. There are a bunch of those, though. Um, React for the serving layer. Uh, Kafka was around, but there are a bunch of different message brokers that people used. Uh, kind of the modern take on this has been something that's usually referred to as the SAC stack. Um, that looks something like Spark and Spark streaming. Uh, for the um, computation itself, uh, ACA, the distributed actor framework um, uh, for kind of the management of data in incoming. Cassandra as a key value store for being able to actually serve this. And then Kafka as both the ingestion and the connective tissue between all these pieces as well. Um, sometimes you'll see this actually as the uh, smack stack with Mesos, if you're deploying this in a Mesos environment as well. Um, so uh, like most companies, we don't actually use the exact canonical stack. So for example, we're not using ACA outside of Spark itself. Uh, we're using a different key value store than Cassandra. Um, and importantly for us, we're running this inside of EMR uh, rather than in Mesos environment. And there's a bunch of advantages that come with that I'll touch on. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like for us. Um, we basically have our on-prem data center where we're taking things out of our production DBs. We batch load them into S3. We do our compute and spark inside EMR and then load, if, if it's a uh, client facing, we'll load it into our production database to use there. This is what would be the batch and then the serving layer. Um, that's pretty traditional for batch computation. If you add in the real-time layer, it looks something like this. Uh, where we stream data in from our production systems. It streams into Kafka. That's read into our Spark clusters that are running. Whoa. Uh -oh. um, and as those Spark clusters are running, they're going to put that data back into Kafka. Uh, it's either going to be re-ingested for more downstream processing or going to be loaded into our production key value store then at that point. Um, this works really well for classical stream processing situations. Um, but you'll notice if you, if you look at kind of the computation we're doing, it's not really a classic stream processing system. We're not just like counting the number of tweets coming through or windowing the number of events or something like that. There's more complexity going on here. Particularly, uh, there's normalized data that's coming through here and changing at different speeds, right? You know, transactions come through at a different rate than people are actually interacting with the site. You get demographic data uploaded, you know, maybe monthly or daily, something like that. These things are all changing at different speeds, but we need all that data available at the same time to do the computation. Second, the computation isn't actually truly incremental. You can imagine when you decide to buy a home, we need to recalculate that in the context of your retirement, uh, sending your kids to college. These things have trade-offs between each other. That means you need all the data available to do that recalculation. Um, for those of you who've used Spark before, you know that there, there is a way to do kind of some statefulness computation in there. Um, there's kind of the, the stateful API, the map with state functions. Um, uh, this is possible to do. We found in practice uh, that that's a hard API for developers to use. It's a drag on developer productivity. It's not flexible enough. Um, and second, that, uh, that requires you to basically store a bunch of things in memory. Um, again, it's doable, but it's not cost, cost effective at a certain scale to be able to storing all that data in memory. Um, so one modification we've made to this um, that has been pretty common in industry is uh, as we take data through here, um, you can imagine uh, one, one situation where 
Um, say we're looking at transactions for people. A common situation is we'll see uh, a bi-weekly or monthly uh, cash flow out of maybe their bank account. Um, and it'll look like, hey, that's they're spending. They're spending $1,000 a month on something. What that actually is is they're just their monthly deposit from their account into their wealth run account, right? And we should not be classifying that as spending because that's not spending. That's, in fact, savings. Um, but to be able to do that, it really helps to be able to look back at the history of transactions they've had and to look at their other accounts that we've had. So we need this pattern of basically random data access uh, that's reading and writing as the stream processing is happening. So a solution we've come up for that um, is to actually run in the inside EMR, running in HBase cluster as well. Um, if you've seen HBase before, there's uh, just performant read-write access. Um, and this has been really flexible for us, so we can do this kind of situation. You can imagine a couple different ways to deploy HBase on these clusters. It's really nice within EMR because it's just another application you can spin up on a dedicated cluster or within the same clusters. Uh, we've played around with having a dedicated cluster that many different applications share the same database. Um, and then we've also played around with having our Spark applications and our HBase cluster co-located on the same actual nodes themselves, um, and then basically managing the life cycle of those two things together. In practice, we found that the convenience of having those two things co-located and being able to isolate the application, isolate the state for it, um, and then have them tied together for the life cycle management, uh, the convenience of that has been the dominating factor for us so far. And that's something that just comes for free on EMR because those are pre-installed. Um, another piece of uh, kind of theory that's been really helpful for us has been this idea of Kappa architecture too. So this uh, idea was first coined in I think 2014 by Jay Kreps out of LinkedIn. Uh, there's been a lot more work um, uh, from him on this and also by a guy named Martin Kletman who was originally at LinkedIn as well. Um, there's a bunch of really key ideas in Kappa architecture about treating data as an immutable stream of data, right? There's no mutable data. It's all a serializable log. Um, it's about avoiding duplicate um, implementations of you don't want to have to implement your logic in batch and in streaming like in Lambda architecture. There are a lot of advantages like that. Um, this is different than the architecture I was just describing and it's not totally the architecture we're using, though we'd like to use many parts of it. Uh, but it does have a lot of interesting lessons that it's, that it's figured out um, that we've applied to our situation as well. Um, one of those is that uh, in this Kappa architecture land, because everything's a stream, when you deploy a code change and you want to recalculate your data with that new code, you need to reprocess your, process your entire history of changes, right? Which sounds crazy. You can do things like compaction of data to speed this up, but this has been testing kind of this idea of stream processing frameworks are getting mature and quick enough that this is actually a feasible thing to do. There's a problem with that, though, of when you're processing streams, there's no end to it, right? You're not done at any point because there's always new data coming in, but you still need to be able to deploy these new changes. Um, the way they've solved this is basically by doing this cutover process that I want to walk you through real quick. Um, so when we're running an application, you can imagine it looking something like this. There's our input topic of Kafka records. Um, that's just running on an EC2 instance. And then we have our Spark application that's reading through this topic and writing out to another topic. That topic might get reprocessed later or might go directly into our, our, our production database table. When we have a new version of that application we want to deploy, which we do at least once a day, multiple times a day in most cases, we basically will go through the process of spinning up a new cluster. Now, uh, whenever that cluster starts, it's going to be way behind the existing cluster, right? It's going to have to start processing the data somewhere. It's way behind. Um, but you can see, as time goes on, as long as we provisioned it for a greater capacity than the actual real-time flow of data, it's going to be able to catch up, right? Because it's going to process records as fast as it can. Um, and soon enough, it'll basically reach the same uh, record position in our Kafka topic as the production pipeline. And when that happens, we can actually just start serving reads from the new application because we know it's up to date with the old one. Um, and once we've cut over and things look okay, then we can go ahead and sunset the existing thing. So that's really easy for us because we're running our Spark application, we're running our, um, our HBase cluster, all in basically the same, cl uh, same EMR cluster, and then we can just delete the Kafka node uh, in, our, in our database, delete that table, and we're good to go with deploying these new streams. Um, uh, so just to take a step back on, on, on why this actually matters to do. Um, I think a couple of the big principles that we believe are actually important for this financial advising idea is that one, people learn best by playing. You develop an intuition for your own kind of financial plan and what that trade-off is by playing with it. So that interactivity of it and the speed of that interactivity is key so that you can actually play around with what does it mean if I retire five years earlier or what does it mean if I send my kid to a private education institution versus a public school. Um, that's a big deal. Uh, and then second, um, that actionable, ad actionable advice is the biggest value we can deliver to clients. So we need to have actually the breadth of different data sources coming in so that we can actually uh, relate it to real life decisions that they have too. Um, this is, uh, uh, I feel pretty comfortable saying that with the quality of data we have um, and the financial expertise we have within the company too, the ceiling for the kind of uh, advice we can provide 
is way higher than anything else out there right now, even than a traditional human financial advisor. And the tricky part is just figuring out how to actually deliver that. Um, the good news is, uh, if you look at kind of the, our competition here, most financial advisors are, are, are nowhere near us. Um, they're sitting somewhere over here uh, where you meet with them about quarterly, and they have basically like the 20 numbers that you tell them kind of situation. Maybe more advanced ones have a little bit more information, but it's nowhere near the kind of information we have. So we're way ahead of that. Um, um, but I don't think this is anyone's really ever applied large-scale data application design to this problem before of financial advising. Um, good news is a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about I think is much broader than just this application. We see Airbnb using a lot of the same strategies actually as well of using these H-based clusters and, and, and figuring out the same kind of ingestion strategies. So I think this is broader and hopefully this can help some of you guys with what you're doing. Um, but if you are interested in solving this financial advising problem, we are hiring and we'd love to talk to you guys. <laughs>